the matter commission's report so that you will hear it in the way and in the words he wrote it. Later on, you will have time to peruse the whole document. On page 70, he says, it is also instructive to observe that when the second defendant representing a cat in the 1916 case was joined in the suit as second defendant, the trial judge noted at Exhibit 2 thus, Mr. Brew, who represented the first defendant, intimated the court that was in, he was requested to appear for the second defendant, Chief Edelton, and he applied to be allowed to do so, which request the court granted to the first defendant who needed a long position, common ownership of this one, the seashore cannot be used exclusively by the plaintiff and his people. And expert for the second defendants, he pleaded ownership of the whole land. <laughs> in, in practice, where a council represents more than one party, it means that the parties he represents have no conflicting interests. The first defendants, in fact, did not claim ownership of the whole land, which the second defendant claimed. Throughout the proceedings, the first defendant did not challenge the second defendant as to the ownership of the whole land. The plaintiff's claim, having been dismissed, and the first defendant having a quiz in the Eckert's claim of ownership of the whole land, and the Eckert's having been found to be in almost an exclusive occupation of the swamp land, as against the claim of the first defendant, the plaintiff and the first defendant in that case are estranged from claiming ownership of the land. I will also go further to page 73. It says, this commission firmly holds the view and so recommends that the creation of 24 villages under Ibn Khan, including at least 12 settlements in the area, was ill advised. The military administrator, who was not an individual, was misled to enact an unlawful edict, which amounted to an affront against the rule of law. It was, in a sense, an executive decision, nullifying the decision in the 1916 case. In their memorandum, Exhibit 87, the Ibnons agreed that the plan or map of the Stop Creek Forest Reserve, Exhibit 10, represents the same landmass in the 1916-17 judgment. In, the, in effect, was the area in respect of which Panak Ibram sought for a declaration of title. The action was dismissed in its entirety up to the Privy Council. It is not their argument that the judgment was not in respect of the, in the area. Indeed, it is their spe special submission in their written address, which is nothing so short of sophistry, that the judgment was in their favor. According to them, the NTRO's case, 1916, gave nothing to it but confirming laws occupation of the entire coast in dispute. Nothing can be further from the truth. It is a blatant misrepresentation. If the ordinary number of people had known the full implication of 16 judgments, they would not succumb to the incitement of their knowledgeable leaders. I quote Justice Ephraim Abata Ebert. The only irresistible reference one can draw from the action of the military administrator 
in considering in the area in even of land is that the essential facts, including the 1916 judgment, were not placed before him. And he inadvisedly failed to seek the opinion of the chiefs and people of the about the accessions of the chiefs and people of Ibn that the 12 villages constituting in the developed area are of Ibn extraction. Indeed, they were not. <laughs> You will take your time and go through all this. But a question that people always ask was that why did they could not pursue prosecution and a white paper for a document so favorable to us. It is because if you peruse the document, you will see that the Honorable Justice listed some people to be prosecuted because of their listed some people to be prosecuted because of their involvement in the crisis. And at that time, Eket was trying to make peace. We wanted peace to reign. And the calibers of people that were supposed to be prosecuted, if you read, some of them will be paramount without by now if we have prosecuted them. So we decided to tamper mercy, justice with mercy. Some people will tell you because it was not, uh, there was no uh, white paper to eat. No, the facts as arrived at by this very prominent justice are facts and facts are sacred. It has nothing to whether it is gazetted or not. Okay, thank you very much. On page 86, it talks about recommendation. The justice said there should be no sacred cow. No citizen, no matter his status in the society, should be allowed to take the law into his hands. There is sufficient evidence to put on trial for malicious damage to property or for arson or murder the following people Erin, Eshet, Erin Ikot, Sam, Ikot Basi, Ethel, Ashana John, Ndarake These were prominent people in Ibn Abana recommended for trial Recommended to be jailed. Some of them now parallel rulers, others were in the past. And if I could have pursued this, we would have made the bitterness last longer. And we thought they understood. Each time we treat them with understanding, they go back to do more. What do they want us to do? It is not late. It's a fact of history. We can reopen this. We can pursue that trial. Because this will be some of the penalties people who want to shift ancient boundaries will stand to face. We will give it to them. There are a lot of cases that we have listed and their input in responding to William Park. You know, I am not a lawyer. The union is right. I will plead that you listen to the National Secretary General, a very distinguished legal practitioner, because through those court judgments that are of interest. 
Good afternoon, very distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and particularly members of the fourth estate of the Red in the media. I appreciate your turning out in the large number. You've heard more than enough. If only we're painstaking to internalize the content of uh, the Ephraim Akata's report. It gives you answers, clear answers to all the issues, the very spurious claims, the preposterous claims, the unfounded claims of William Park. I don't want to take us backwards, but there's a particular one that I want you know to read to us. It was already read in page 70. I'll give you an explanation on the background to this. Mr. Brew represented the first defendant. The first defendant was Upeneka. The same Mr. Brew represented the Akin nation or the people of Akin in the same case. And in law, the only basis in practice where a council represents more than one party, it means that the parties it represents have no conflicting interest. It means that even as at the 1914 case, Upenekan had no claim against a, they didn't seek for the ownership of that land. If they had done so, it wouldn't have been possible to have one lawyer represent them and also represent us. And here the Honorable Justice said that they acquiesce to the, the case of the Eke people. To acquiesce means to give consent, to acquiesce means to go to sleep, to acquiesce means you're not bothered, to acquiesce means you agree with the case of Eke. He therefore said on that grounds, he said the people are permanently stopped from claiming ownership of that land. And William Barr is of the Upenekan stock. What his ancestors couldn't do, he's attempting to do now. The ancestors saw the truth that the land was that of Eket, and they are stopped by that judgment. But William Barr now seems to know better than his forefathers, you know, who were stopped, who were stopped by that judgment from building. So we've had several extant judgments that we'll be able to bring all to you, otherwise we won't have enough time in one day to accomplish that. But be that as it may, I will attempt to bring a few that I believe uh, you know, we could work with. The Akit Nation, in page 4 of our text, the Akit Nation instituted an action in suit number FHC slash Y slash UY slash CS slash 53 slash 2003. His Highness, His Royal Highness, Obama Jew and 32 other Eket sons sued NNPC and two others. The two other defendants were Mobile, Exxon Mobile, and the government of a private state. The Eket Nation, by the writ of summons, claimed the inter alien compensation due them. For the value of unexpected, unexhausted improvements in the in that area of land within the Stop Street Forest, acquired by the Aquarium State Government for the expansion of Mobile. I'll explain. Mobile had acquired you know, land in the Stop Street for the expansion. I mean, the government had acquired land for the expansion of mobile facilities. So we went to court. And um, the case was heard and determined in our favor, and we were given judgment. We have certified two copies of that judgment here to give to you. But very quickly, for want of time, I'll just read um, I'll just read page
Let me make it just read uh, page 43, some portion of page 43. It says, with the Elmerdeck decision of the Supreme Court in mind, one will only be saying the obvious, that Exhibit PW2, Exhibit PW2 is a Privy Council judgment we exhibited, is a mere surplusage, which equally goes to show that even if the matter was for declaration of title, the plaintiff by the Privy Council decisions, decision are, en are entitled as owners of the stop strip. So either way, the plaintiffs are entitled to the claim. In effect, I'm in strong pedestal to hold that the plaintiffs have discharged the burden of proof in this case to be entitled to their claims. In the final al analysis, I hold that the plaintiffs have proved their case by preponderance of evidence and they are entitled to the, to the relief as per their statement of claim. This judgment was given in 2012. It is valid, it is subsisting. It gives us all the powers, all the privileges, all the rights and the proprietary interests over the stop street forest reserve, of which UIT is just a tiny little fraction. And this stop street forest reserve, like we've said, it goes beyond the intertiger. It's by whatever definition or by whatever standard, it is littoral and it makes us a great people, a littoral community. The next um, document I want us to look at are two letters. So like it's stated here, may I also humbly refer you to a letter dated 9th March 1998, titled Payment of Compensation to a Doe Group of Villages. The said letter emanated from the Permanent Secretary Office of the Ministry Administrator Government of the Pybon State and addressed to the Honorable Commissioner, Minister of Agriculture, Natural Resources and Rural Development, directing payment to a group of villages. A group of villages is the next record and forms part of the Ked Nation. As compensation for part of the stop street forest acquired by government for the expansion of mobile quiet terminal, QIT. 3B, see further another letter on the same subject matter dated 17 February 1998 written under the hand and seal of the Honorable Commissioner for Agriculture and Natural Resources and Rural Development. I want to bring, you know, I want to give you copies of that letter and if I have your permission and consent, um, and just allow me to read a few portions of the said letter. The first letter being the letter of the Permanent Secretary in the Office of the Military Administrator. He says, I am directed to refer to your letter number MOA slash COM slash 15 slash volume 10 279 of 17 February 1998 on the above subject matter and to convey to you, His Excellency, the military administrator's approval for payment of 18 billion 340,000 naira only to a group of villages through Mrs. Joyce Udo of United Chambers as compensation for part of the Stop Street Forest Reserve acquired by government for expansion of mobile QIT. Now, if you see, the, if you look at the second document, that's the one written by the Honorable Commissioner, he clearly stated the reason for the payment, that the portion, you know, that was acquired by government for the purpose of the expansion was clearly the property of the Edo group of villages which is a village in SFA, and like I said earlier, which also forms part of the Ekid Nation. So if we have all these documents, then you can imagine how one will claim to be the sole owners of QIT, whereas they don't own a piece of, uh, of QIT. And number four, and I also most respectfully refer to suit number HK 108 2002, Chief Ubon Peter Hassan, that's of the Surveyor General of Paragon State, and two others. The other two others were um, the Attorney General of Paragon State and the, Gov and the Governor of Paragon State. Judgment in this suit was given in favor of the plaintiff, Chief Ubon Hassan, currently Paramount Law of this record. The following orders were made 
I have copies of the documents here of the judgment. I shall let you have the judgment. But um, let me just read the orders that were made. One, a declaration that the village of Ineapoto, in this state, local government of a quiet home state, is entitled to be shown and located on the map of this record local government area and of a quiet home state as produced by the first defendant. It is order number two, it is order that the first defendant shall produce maps of this record local government area and of a quiet home state and locate the plaintiff's village in its correct position. Thereon, in order not to disenfranchise it, a third order was made. Let me just pause here and say this as a statement of fact that the last authentic legal documented gazetted map of a private state is the map of 1987. Upon the creation of a private state in 1987, to date, no officially gazetted map has been made of a private state. So this judgment was not talking about remapping. This document, this judgment was talking about mapping, not remapping. There's a clear cut distinction between mapping and remapping. If a private had a valid and subsisting officially gazetted map, then there wouldn't be any need for you to say mapping. The court would have said remap. But since no boundary delineations known to law, legally gazetted official, was in existence, the court said map. And up to this very minute, was still begging and asking government for that map and would not say anything. Because I believe that if that map were to be in place, in line with our historical you know, facts and extant judgments, then we won't you know, have to come here holding a press you know, conference in the first instance. It is pertinent for me to also let you know that that judgment is still valid, it is subsisting, it was not appealed against by the defendant, but strangely, the same defendant that refused to implement it. They refused to execute the decision of the judgment of the High Court of the Quiet State. Please be informed that in the Akbaton village in Esrek, a local government area, forming part of Eket Nation, is located by the Atlantic Ocean coastline beyond the intertidal deep and shallow water and is absolutely littoral by whatever standards or definition. Number three, it is no worry that even MPNU, Exxon Mobil, knows without any shadow of doubt that they, Exxon Mobil, are tenants of the Egypt people and not even as wrongly claimed by Mr. William Barr and the people of Egypt. On the 30th of June 2010, upon the excavation by a function of the 40 years lease granted NPNU, that's what we produce in Nigeria Limited, by the then South Eastern State Government, the people of Ibnon, William Park, inclusive, took out an originating summons against the Attorney General of Apartment State and NPU ExxonMobil in suit number HK 45 2010. Seeking, among other things, a declaration of title, right of occupancy, and injunction over the Koyibo terminal, QIT, occupied by, by Mobile, while also claiming some reversionary interest and rights over QIT. The AK people were joined in the action upon an application for joinder as third to 16 defendants. The defendants all raised preliminary objections to the set suit of the plaintiffs. Now, I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that even more people, they know and they've confessed that Eke are their actual landlord. They told Mobile clearly, very clear and strong terms, you cannot possibly be the owner of QIT, you are not our landlords. So let me refer. The preliminary objection in this matter, there are three you know, sets of defendants. We have government. We had mobile, then the AK people joined. So the three sets of defendants filed their preliminary objections. Their preliminary objections were basically the same. Two grounds. First, that the, the, the suit of mobile was cut off by limitation or by the limitation laws of a private state. And then the suit of even was cut off 
by the limitation law of quantum state. Then secondly, that they came wrongly, by a wrong procedure, by a wrong commencement. They came with an originating summons. Originating summons are not used when issues are dynamically variable, when there's conflict. They, they came wrongly. So everybody said the same thing. But strictly, what you probably would have expected us to say was what Mobile did. Now, let me read that. The primary objection of ExxonMobil bore the same character as the rest, except that it was spiced with additional relief, which included an order dismissing the suit of the Yemen people for being an abuse of the judicial and or court process and striking out and or setting aside the claim for being incompetent. In respect of the issue of abuse of court process, ExxonMobil argued through its counsel, Dr. Ataki, SN, that in view of the 1918 decision of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, Chief Mutiello and another, and Igor to Papan and another, 1918, NLR Volume 3, pages 10 to 15, where the Privy Council upheld the decision of Weber J and the Supreme Court of Nigeria to the effect that the Ibonos failed to prove their case and were not entitled to the declaration as to title of the subject matter, Akiya. This case was an abuse of court process. So Mobo referred to several statutory instruments and official gazette and concluded that to attempt to spawn this weapon isn't their land. And I've told them so. And the beauty of this case is that the court upheld the case of Mobo. I mean, the case of Ibonos, forgive me. Ibonos went on appeal. The plaintiffs in the aforementioned suit, the Ibonos people, filed an appeal against the central government and they lost it soundly. They lost woefully. Copies of the ruling of the Court of Appeal, Calabar Division, of holding the earlier decision of the High Court of the Court, aforementioned, is available and shall be you know, given to you. Now, I'm winding down to what I consider less critical you know, matters. Mr. William Kraus' postulation that the creation of Ibnon, local government from a cap, confers title on Ibnon and or deprives the people of their proprietary rights or interests in Akiya subscript forest is very, very, very laughable, just like it is also very pedestrian. Makes no little sense whatsoever. Neither the creation of a local government, that's our position, the position of a local government, neither the creation of a local government area nor a new state can usurp the rights of ownership of land or otherwise vested interests, proprietary rights, powers and privilege, privileges of the original owners. This was the decision of the Supreme Court in the case, now notorious case, of Alphonsus Nkuma, the son Joseph, who two new year orderly, reported in 2001, volume 15 of the Nigerian Weekly Law Report, at 737, page 570, at page 586. In fact, in this case, the claimants were from River State, while the land was across the border in Imo State. It still had nothing to do with the proprietary right of the original owners. If you are an, if you're owner of the land, you are owner of the land. But, um, but you know, unfortunately, in this circumstance, there's no authentic official gazette delineation, boundary delineation for them to even say that the land is in Ibram. The land is not in Ibram. The land is in Ekeb. The government of Afrika State has said so in those letters that I read to you. The letter from the PEMSEC of the Office of the Military Administrator, Government of Afrika State, and the letter from the Honorable Commissioner of Agriculture, Natural Resources and Rural Development. It says so. The land belongs to a hill community in Esreke, who are also part of the Eke, you know, nation. And you don't have an idea when we talk about Scotsman Forest Reserve. You're probably looking at what tiny little swamp where people just go to cut live sticks or tap down wine. Stops Creek Forest Reserve is probably bigger than the entire area which we now occupy. Probably much bigger. And that is exactly where our forefathers fought for and got as the ancestral land 
Way back in 2009, the Supreme Court judgment of 2016, I was upheld, I mean 1916, I was upheld in 1980. And that's final. Nobody can litigate again on, on that. Before I conclude on these matters, you will still permit me to go back to Mr. Rapata's document. Now, yes, I, I will. You know, when the president read uh, something from from Ephraim Rapata, I don't know if uh, we were we have we listened. Let me read if, if you know um, something to us. Um, if, if you read from page 73, it says the commission firmly holds the view and so recommends that the creation of 24 villages under the under even of plan, including at least 12 settlements in the area, was still advised. And this is the area they are still coming to fight for. It says the military administrator who was not an indigent, was misled <coughs> to enact an unlawful edict which amounted to an affront against the rule of law. It was, in a sense, an executive decision, nullifying the decision in the 1916 case. So any attempt whatsoever by government, and this is a military government with a military fiat, this is it's an attempt to nullify that judgment. Meaning that you can't tamper with our rights and interests. We didn't agree here on Stockton Forest Reserve. He goes on to say this. In their memorandum exhibit 87, the Ebenos agreed that the plan or map of the Stockton Forest Reserve, exhibit 10, represents the same landmass in the 1916 to 1917 case. This is the same place that the Ebenos keeps returning to. And it says, in a, in effect, was an area in respect of which Mpana, Ibono, sought for a declaration of title. The action was dismissed in its entirety up to the Privy Council. It is not their argument that the judgment was not in respect of the, the area. Indeed, it is their special submission that in their, in their written address, which is nothing short of sophistry, that the judgment was in their favor. How possible? According to them, the entire Rose case of 1916 gave nothing to the Eke or confirmed the occupation of the entire coast in this field. Now, this is what Ephraim Rapata had to say. He said, nothing can be further from the truth. It is a blatant misrepresentation. If the ordinary even of people had known the full implication of the 1916 judgment, they would not succumb to the incitement of their knowledgeable leaders. Now, so the question is, I mean, if a Rapata came from a uh, no state, presided over a panel and knew all this, how come, uh, you know, uh, even or doesn't? How come maybe even government, you know, doesn't? But strangely, the outsider seems to know, like mobile knows. Mobile knows. Then let me read further. Is that the only irresistible inference one can draw from the action of the military administrator in conceding in the area of the Ibn of plan is that the essential facts, including the 1916 judgment, were not placed before him, and he inadvisedly failed to seek the opinion of the chiefs and people of the Ken about the accession of the chiefs and people of Ibn and the 12 villages consisting in the area of Ibn extraction. I should be done in a few minutes, but it's pertinent that I read this section. Exactly what we are about is doing now. They did it before Ifa Mapata. And here what Ifa Mapata said about their attitude. They said this. The Ibnons in their written address, just like you know, uh, William Mapata, made the point that they are in exclusive possession of the land now being claimed by Eke, they proceeded to state the five ways as established by deciding cases how ownership of land in Nigeria can be established. There are five ways of establishment. Long possession is one of them. 
the evidence of the family neighbors is one of them having an adjoining, you know, uh, you know, land, a land that is contiguous is one of them. So, by deciding cases, that ownership of land in Nigeria can be established, and went on to submit that they had satisfied the five requirements with very due respect. We would say that the submission is misleading. There is no doubt that the legal principle prescribing the methods of establishment of ownership of land has been well stated. The true position, however, which they cannot run away from, they, can't, they, couldn't, have, they, they couldn't run in 1993, they can't run now from, is that they failed to establish any of the five requirements in the 1916 case, and that their case was dismissed after a party's case has been dismissed by a competent court. The law does not permit him to use any device, artifice, or legal chicanery to reopen his claim. The party is not allowed to thereafter take possession of the land by trickery or otherwise by force or by, you know, surreptitiously like even on. He's now doing, going into the stock street and building all kinds of rubbish. That cannot help them get what we didn't get as a 1916. It says, and come back to the court or tribunal or a commission such as us and say, I have been exercising acts of long possession and enjoyment over the land to qualify me as owner of the land. He will not be allowed to gain in the roundabout what he had lost in the swing. The acts of exercise of proprietary rights claimed by the owners, therefore, lacks legal backing. I would have seen. So let me just, uh, I could have still read more when he claimed um, the lease agreement was signed between them uh, and Mobile. You know, there's a portion here that clearly shows that the lease agreement was not in any way signed, you know, between them and Mobile. They not even us claim that they own the land of the Stock Street Forest Reserve, part of which was reserved, blah, blah, blah. But it goes on to say that. It's all lies. The lease agreement was not signed between them. The lease agreement was signed with, between Mobile and the Southern State Government. So, conclusively, William Parr said that the PIA is in the perfect document. To this, we say yes. We may agree with him only to the extent that the settlers' three percent OPEX. The OPEX means the actual operational expenditure of the settler. Is far too meager and clearly insufficient to assay or mitigate our several years of marginalization and devastation of our ecosystem from oil and gas exploration activities. But we're also very quick to act that the PIA is, a, is work in progress. Let's make do with what we have for now. Relevant amendments will come with the experience gained from its implementation and from judicial interpretations. We can also attest to the fact that there is no ambiguity whatsoever in the definition of the host community under the PIA. The sharing matrix proposed or touted by Mr. Mpa is therefore illegal, illogical, and outrightly dubious. See sections 235.